Hello and welcome to episode 3. So uh, it would be very useful to know where exactly collisions are occurring, whether they're below our character or above it, to the left, to the right. So what we're going to do is go into our controller script and we're going to create a little public struct called something like collision info. And uh, this is basically going to have a whole bunch of public bools and uh, I'm going to call them things like above, below, left, and right. And I'm also going to make a public void called reset, in which we can uh, just reset all of these bools to false. So I um, can just say above equals false. Actually, instead of doing this all individually, I'll say above is equal to below is equal to false. And just on a new line, I'll do left equals right equals false. Um, now, let's make a public reference to our collision info. Uh, collision info, you can just call it something like collisions. And in the move method at the top, um, we want to call collisions.reset. So we've got a blank slate each time, and then in the horizontal and vertical collisions we'll set the appropriate variable to true. So uh, in horizontal, for example, if hit, if we've collided with something, then we want to set it depending on the direction. So uh, let's do it like this, let's say collisions dot left is equal to, well, just one equal sign, is equal to direction dot direction x now two equal signs, um, negative one. So if we've hit something and we're going left, then collisions.left will be equal to true. And same story with collisions.right, only this time it's of course if direction x is equal to one. And uh, we can do a similar thing in our vertical collisions. We can say collisions.above, Actually, let's make this below just to be consistent. Direction y equals negative 1, and above if direction y is equal to 1. All right, so now in the player script, to combat this uh, problem I was demonstrating earlier, where uh, we sort of accumulate gravity as we're uh, standing on the ground, um, we can say if controller. Oops, I must start the O. If controller dot uh, collisions dot above or controller dot collisions dot below, then we want to reset our velocity on the y axis. So we'll say velocity dot y equals zero. Now you can see that when we're on the ground, we're no longer accumulating gravity. And if we step off the edge, we now fall off at a rather more sedate pace. All right, so what I want to look at now is jumping. So let's say if input dot get key down, um, I'm going to use the space bar to jump. So if the space bar is pressed, and if there is a collision below the player, in other words, it's standing on something, then um, we can say velocity dot y is equal to jump velocity. And uh, let's create that jump velocity variable. Um, float jump velocity is equal to, let's pick a random number, how about 8? Okay, so let's have a look at what we've done. So I'm going to press the spacebar, and we are jumping indeed, so that's good news. Um, the problem with these two variables, though, the gravity and the jump velocity, is they're not very intuitive. I mean, we've got these values negative 20 and 8, but it's, it's difficult to imagine what that really means. And uh, so what we'd really like is to not assign anything directly to these variables but to rather have two other variables, namely the jump height and uh, 
time to jump apex and uh, we'd assign values to these and that would determine what gravity and jump velocity are set to. And the nice thing about these values is they're far more intuitive. I mean, we can think how high do we want our character to be able to jump, let's say four units, and how long do we want the character to take to reach the highest point in, uh, in his or her jump. And uh, that's also fairly intuitive. We could say maybe roughly 0.4 of a second. So uh, hopefully you'll agree that uh, these two variables are far sort of more friendly to, to play with than these sort of rather abstract gravity and jump velocity variables. So what we need to do now is to figure out how to take this information and translate it into that. So we're going to look at some equations. All right, so just to reiterate, now that we've got it all nicely up on the screen here, um, jump height and time to jump apex are our two known values and we're solving for gravity and jump velocity. Now, perhaps the best way to think about this is, uh, imagine we're at the top of our jump, the apex of our jump, and uh, so we're no longer moving up and we're not yet moving down, so our initial velocity is equal to zero. Now think of it in reverse, as we come back to the ground, we can treat gravity as our acceleration and uh, jump velocity will be our final velocity, the velocity that we have when we finally hit the Earth. Now if you've done any physics, you might be familiar with this kinematic equation, which says that the change in movement is equal to the initial velocity multiplied by time, plus acceleration multiplied by time squared over 2. Now, uh, if we replace those values with our own variables, delta movement becomes jump height. Initial velocity multiplied by time can be left out, since, as we discussed, our initial velocity in this case is equal to 0. Acceleration becomes gravity, and time becomes the time to the jump apex. And now we're trying to solve for gravity, so let's look at how we can rearrange this equation so that we've got gravity on the left and everything else on the right. So the first step would probably be to multiply both sides by 2. So now we've got 2 times jump height is equal to gravity times time to jump apex squared. And now we could divide both sides by gravity. And we get 2 times jump height over gravity is equal to time to jump apex squared. Now, if we divide 1 by the whole equation to get the reciprocal, we get gravity over 2 times jump height is equal to 1 over time to jump apex squared. And now we can simply multiply both sides by 2 times jump height. And we've isolated the unknown. Gravity is equal to 2 times jump height over time to jump apex squared. All right, so now to calculate jump velocity, we can use another equation which says that the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus acceleration multiplied by time. And since by now we've worked out gravity, which is acceleration, um, we can simply say that jump velocity is equal to gravity multiplied by time to jump apex. Once again, we leave out initial velocity because that is equal to zero. All right, that's the end of my little maths lecture. Um, let us now implement this into our player class. So in the start method, we can say gravity is equal to two times jump height divided by time to jump apex squared. So let's say mathf dot power of time to jump apex and we're raising it to the power two. All right. And uh, we actually want our gravity to be negative, so I'm going to tack on a negative sign over there. And uh, for the jump velocity, as we discovered, this is equal to gravity multiplied by the time to jump apex. And uh, since gravity is now negative, we just want to say... Uh, mathf dot absolute value of gravity to make sure that it's we're using the positive version of it. And just for interest's sake, let's do a little printout of gravity and uh, the jump velocity.
and uh, let's make these values public so that we can mess around with them in the inspector and uh, now if we go here and press play you can see that with the uh, default values of 4 for jump height and 0.4 for time to jump apex it's given us a gravity of negative 50 and a jump velocity of 20 All right so that looks pretty cool uh, I want to mess around a bit, say I have a jump height of 8, and time to jump apex is, say, 1 second. Interesting. Let me make that uh, 0.6. So anyway, hopefully you can see why we went through all of that. Um, these really are much more intuitive values to to play with to get the sort of uh, jumping and gravity feeling good in the game. Okay, let me just change this back to something more reasonable. Um, let's say three point five and point point four maybe. Uh, let's see how that looks. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. Um, I want to just add some smoothing to our X movement so that it's not so abrupt, the change in direction. So in our play script, instead of directly setting velocity.x equal to input.x times move speed, we can create a float target velocity x, and uh, now we can say velocity.x is equal to mathf.smoothdamp, and we pass in our current velocity, which is velocity.x, and our target velocity, which of course is target velocity x. Then we need a reference to a float containing the velocity of the actual smooth function. So uh, up here we can just create a um, little float which we can call um, velocity x smoothing and we just leave that alone. We never assign to that. That's uh, handled by the smooth damp function. So we just say ref velocity x smoothing. And now it wants a float for the smooth time, which is basically how long it will take to uh, go from the current velocity to the target velocity. Now, uh, for now, I'll just say 0.1. But um, what we're actually going to do is create two floats. The one will be acceleration time, um, let's say, airborne, and the other will be acceleration time grounded. All right, so for the airborne, um, we probably want to change direction a little bit slower when we're in the air, so that could be equal to, say, 0.2 and this one might be equal to 0.1. Um, now, we can replace this uh, value here with a statement, which is controller.collisions.below. In other words, we're grounded. If that's the case, then we'll use acceleration time grounded. Otherwise, we'll use acceleration time airborne. All right, so let's have a look at how that looks in practice. So we've got some acceleration. You can see we're uh, smoothly slowing down. And when we're in the air, that whole process happens a little bit slower. All right, cool. Um, I'm going to end this episode so that I can upload it, hopefully before I go to bed. And I will see you in episode four. Goodbye.